Okay, Romans, the book that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. We're continuing on, and this has just been like one, one uh, sermon after another in this, right? I mean, you just can't help it as you study through the book of Romans. There are so many things to learn that are important, and that's why I've always called it New Testament Theology 101. Because uh, the book of Romans just does that for us. It really teaches us the things that we're supposed to understand. It might seem as though, uh, as I go through this, that I, steep, I, I just keep on hitting uh, every week um, this uh, just almost like just kicking at it like it's a dead horse or something. Because everyone here understands it, right? But maybe you don't. And maybe there's someone who doesn't. And also remember that we have our, these are videoed and they go on YouTube and people watch them that aren't here. So uh, we never know who might be listening. And I just want to make sure that I, I point out all these things that Paul is teaching us that salvation is not acquired by our earning it. And it's not something that we can earn. It's not something you would ever be able to earn in your entire life. You could never do it. It's worth too much for you to be able to earn it. And you don't arrive on your own merit at heaven's door. If you do, Jesus says, I didn't know you. Right? You, you don't arrive in your own, clothed in your own righteousness. You wear the righteousness the king sent you. Right? Which is in Jesus our Christ. So, anyway, um, as we hit chapter 11, um, it, it's, it's not going to stop. It's going to continue. Paul is keeping on drilling this into us. Um, like the Jew, too many have a sought to establish their own righteousness, even in the church. The Jews, and he covered this in the previous chapter, not all of the Jewish people attained a right standing with God. Because living by the law, under the, according to the law, did not give you righteousness. It was just meant to show you you didn't have any. And then you needed to borrow some, right? And you needed a Savior, so, the, and, he, and, he, and he went over that in the, in the last chapter. That, so what are we going to say then? You know, well, what, what we have to say here is that the Jews who tried and attempted to attain righteousness through the law missed it because they were attempting to attain it by their own merit, their own righteousness. But yet, Gentiles who didn't even have a law have attained righteousness because they didn't approach it on their own merit, but by faith. And you see, and that's the thing that we're supposed to understand, is that we, we, uh, righteousness is bestowed upon us, and we're called righteous because we have faith in God. Now you might say, well, then you're earning it by your faith, right? Well, if you really want to split hairs, okay, I guess that's it, your, your faith. But it's not earned, it's just you're trusting in it. It's, I'm just, I believe it, I'm trusting it. Okay, then you got it, right? I'm trusting in His righteousness to cover me. So, uh, we're not under the law, but under grace. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness, righteousness for everyone who believes. And that was right out of what Paul said in the last one. So, if you could attain righteousness by observing the law, it would be yours, not God's. And you could never measure up to his. It's just, that's just the way it is. So today, we're going to learn a little bit about the remnant of Israel that has been, always has been, and will stay faithful. There always has been a faithful remnant of Israelites all throughout the days. Um, so uh, Paul's going to tell us a little bit about that. And beginning with in chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left and they're trying to kill me. See, Elijah said that about Israel. They've rejected you. They've rejected uh, your prophets. They've torn down your altars. They're not your people anymore. 
Okay, now, uh, all, so, so Paul says, all, are all the promises in the Old Testament to Israel nullified then? And he says, no, they're not. They're not nullified. Just because they were punished and they were given a time out back then, you know, that, that happened again and then it's, it's happened again at the, after the time of Jesus for refusing Messiah. So they've been put on a time out again and this time was the longest one. It was almost 2,000 years. In fact, it's been, it, it's, it's been past that now because, well, not quite yet. But anyway, it's, it's creeping up on it on the 2,000-year time out um, because they're still not really turned back to God yet. There are some, but as a nation, they're a very secular nation, Israel is. They're, they're not set apart to God in their hearts. Now, he still has them as his chosen nation, and the promises in the Old Testament to them will happen. They will be given to them. And that's why I, I, I don't, I, you know, here's, here's one thing that I want to tell you. Every heresy, I borrowed this, I know it's real clever, and, it may, and I'd like to sound like I made it up, but I borrowed it from someone else. This is a very clever saying, though. Every heresy that would ever creep into the church was anticipated in advance. Okay? All the heresies that ever have come into the church or still will was already anticipated in advance by the Holy Spirit and He already knew they were happening and in Scripture somewhere it deals with every one of them. So, one of the heresies that's in the church in the modern age is called amillennialism. Okay, that's, yeah, that's one of those big words, and you're like, oh, millennialism. But it's a heresy, according to Scripture. And it's dealt with right here in this passage. Part of all millennialism is that the church becomes the new Israel, or it's called replacement theology. That's part of it, that the church has replaced Israel. And the reason that we are God's blessing and all that now is because we replaced Israel. Israel is no longer God's pet people. It's now the church. And all of the promises that were given to Israel transfer over to the church instead. Okay, That is taught in many churches. That's called replacement theology, or and it's part of amillennialism, which you know, we call it amillennialism because one of the biggest parts of it is that they don't believe that there's going to be a literal thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth, like Scripture says there is, that that will happen, where He will come back and reign for a thousand years on the earth physically. Okay, scripture says that, but they, part of amillennialism is they reject that and they say it's symbolic. And He reigns in our hearts, or whatever else. And that we have already entered that time, and that that's already happening, and we're in it now. Okay, well, it's not, because during that time, there's, there's one good argument. During that time of the millennial reign of Christ on the earth, Satan, the evil one, the devil, is chained and thrown into the pit. Okay? So if this is that time, his chain's way too long. Right? I mean, you get what I'm saying? The, the evil that it comes from hell is, is going to be throttled during that thousand-year millennial reign. It's only just what evil might lurk in the hearts of people. But it's not a spiritual evil that is going to be boosted by the devil and, and his minions during that time. And at the end of that thousand years... He's going to be let loose again, and he's going to run amok again. That's what Scripture says about it, okay? So if we are in that era, though, his chain's too long, because he's, he's, he's messing with us all the time, messing with the church all the time. So that's one good argument against it. But Paul, uh, anticipated by the Holy Spirit, anticipated the amillennial um, heresy right here in this when he says that, did God reject his people? By no means, no. And he's saying that he, they, he will deal with them again. And so right here in Scripture, you know, you've got to deal with this if you're trying to say that, that they're not his plan anymore and the church has replaced them. So anyway, this runs right up into that. So God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Elijah was a godly man surrounded by ungodly, and he thought that he was alone and that but God corrected him in the next verses. God, this is what God said to him, and I'll read verses 4 through 6. And what was God's answer to him? 
I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it's no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Right? I mean, that logic, it makes sense. It's, not, it's by grace, not by works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. It'd be earned, and you'd have to call it something else. Right? Paul's being very logical here. So here again, this, this, this passage I just read, along with the one before, tells us that there's still a remnant of Israel. And, and they have not bowed the knee to, to Baal, so to speak, just like back in Elijah's time. There, are pe there is a remnant of, of Jewish people, Israel people, who have found righteousness by borrowing God's righteousness through faith. So there still, even to this day, in this present age, is a remnant of Israel that is saved by faith. Now, they're probably part of the Christian church and not a practicing Jewish religion. They're probably Christians, but they're of Israelite descent. See, there is a remnant still, and God will gather them back together. And part of our uh, New Testament prophecy of what's going to happen in the end times and all that is that they will gather back together and there will be witnesses to Christ, 144,000 of them, by the way. And I think it's probably a youth movement because it says they're young virgins. So I, I, I think that that's a youth movement most likely. You know, the only way I would be able to explain that one. So anyway, there's going to be at that time 144,000 of them and they're going to be witnesses to Christ but Jewish. And they're from the 12 tribes of Israel. So yes, Israel will be back on the forefront in God's working on earth again in the future. Just right now, it's not quite, it's not there yet. It's, it's not there. It's the church still, all right? So, 7,000 were still faithful as a remnant when Elijah uh, thought they were all gone, and God corrected him. So at Paul's present time, when he wrote this, 1st century A.D., he said even then there was a remnant of Israel who remained faithful to God, and they were the ones who accepted Christ and began this church. And so they're still, they're still out there today, these years later. They received God's uh, righteousness by receiving Christ by faith. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ, not by works, so no man can boast. Paul also wrote that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. So this is a theme that runs all throughout the New Testament. It's not a verse I'm taking out and saying, hey, I'm going to create a new theology with this, right? No, it is New Testament theology. That's what we're supposed to learn when we read it. And it's just a wonder that so many in the church have replaced grace with a works-based theology. Their soteriology, their, their method of acquiring salvation is merit-based. You got to do this. You got to do this. And you better do this or you're not saved. The minute someone tacks on the possibility of you losing your salvation by doing something wrong, they've just entered into a salvation that's by works and not by faith. Because if, if you can't get it by merit, then merit is not going to take it away either because it wasn't based on merit. He died before you were ever even born, before you committed any of those sinful acts that you commit, that you're going to. You were saved when you put your faith in Him and, and you hadn't stopped sinning yet. I guarantee it. I don't think that you've stopped yet, any of you. And if you think you have and want to challenge me on it, I'll just follow you a little bit. You know, and I'm going to be the first one to say, I, I haven't stopped. Can't help it. I've got that monkey in the backpack. I have that old nature that rears its ugly head all the time. And every decision that is spiritual that comes up, and most of them are, if it really comes down to it, every spiritual decision that comes up, I have a choice to follow the spirit or follow the flesh. What do we do? We follow the flesh too much. And hopefully we'll get better and better. But what happens? Two steps forward, one step back. And then every now and then you take one step forward and take two steps back. 
Right? It does happen. We get into that. And that's what, what we are. And so I'm very grateful that salvation is by grace through faith and not by works. You know, I'm very thankful for that. Verses 7 through 10. What then? What Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain. But the elect did. The others were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes so that they could not see, and ears so they could not hear, to this very day. And David says, May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and their backs be bent forever those who would reject Christ. So Paul says that those who were not elect were hardened. Now we talked about this a lot a couple of weeks back, and I talked about the whole issue between free will versus predestination. And when people ask me, which one do you stand? Do you, do you believe in predestination? Or do you believe in free will? And I say, yes. That's my answer. I believe in them both. God has a destiny for each and every one of us, but gives us a free will of whether or not we're going to obey and enter it. And there's a fork in the road all the time, you see. But anyway, uh, they were hardened. There were some who were hardened. And you might say, well, then why would he harden them, which wouldn't allow them to soften up and come back to him because he hardened them? Why would he do that? Then that took away their free will, didn't it? No. It didn't take away their free will. And here's the only way that can happen is because God knows the end from the beginning. And he hardened those who were not going to turn to him. And he already knew that about them. We don't know that about anybody. Anybody you meet on the street and you say, oh, that's a, that person will never be a believer. You should stop saying that because you might be surprised. It could happen. What we should do is to those who are not believers, we should consider them not believers yet. Right? And it could still happen. And we hope it will. We hope and pray that that person will turn to Christ, put their faith in Him. We always hope for that for everyone. And since I don't know who the elect are, I don't know who they're not the elect, I must treat them all as though they're the possible elect. That's the way I should treat everybody as if they're not believer yet. And I hope they're going to be. Because only God knows the ones who will never. Okay, and if he hardens them, that's his choice. He can do that. But I trust my God enough to believe that he's not going to harden someone who would turn to him otherwise. Okay, the Pharaoh in Egypt was not going to ever turn in faith to God. God hardened him and used him as an object for his wrath. But God knew him. He knew him from before he was born. He knew every decision he would ever make. And he knew he was not going to ever turn to him. So he used him as something to show his wrath on. And there are people out there today who will be used the very same way. Uh, but we don't know who they are. God does. Because God, because God knows the end from the beginning. And he knows who will have a heart that will listen to him and come to him. And who will never so he has the right to use them for whatever. Anyway, Paul says here in this verses 7 through 10, um, Israel sought so earnestly they didn't obtain. That was this righteousness. They were trying through merit to obtain a righteousness, and they didn't attain it. But the elect did. Who are the elect? Those who trust God, who would believe that it comes from him. And, the, and the, that becomes the church, right? And the first of them, the first among the church, were Jews. They, so, you know, there were some Jews who came to Christ. It's just that as a whole, Judaism rejected him. So, you know, they kept going straight down the same straight tracks when God's track veered off to the right and, and went with Christ as his method. This is the way we're going. And they said, no, we're not going with you. See? And that's what happened. So, Paul says that those who were not the elect were hardened. In verse 8, he describes what he means by hardened, okay? Verse 8, there's a Greek word, katanixis. Katanixis. You're going to remember that if I ask you again next week, right? 
No, you won't. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's translated in some translation or in some other places. That same Greek word is translated slumber in some places. Um, so it's a word that can mean that. Um, it's used when, it's a word that was used when uh, describing numbness or stupor. You know, when a spider bites its victim, they kind of go into a numb stupor. It's like a slumber state, kind of, you know, and they don't move. All right. Anyway, it's, 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 they use that when they're talking about what happens to an insect or whatever when a spider bites it or a poison from a snake or anything like that. What poison does to the body, um, like from a sting. Um, and that kind of sting can cause deafness or blindness. Right? Uh, from, from poisons like that. Well, this happens in a spiritual way. Deafness and blindness. You're blind to the things of Christ. You're blind to the things of the Holy Spirit. You just don't see it. Right? And that's the case of all who don't believe. The, the gospel, the gospel message or the, the word of God, they're blinded to seeing it. You know, maybe from your own story you can remember a time before when you didn't believe and you might have heard something about the Bible or a verse from the Bible and it just, eh, I don't get it, you know. And it didn't really mean much to you. It didn't really have any value to you, right? You're kind of like a pig that you put a pearl necklace on and they're like, what are these white rocks? Can't eat them. They're worthless to me, right? That's casting your pearls before swine, right? Well, they don't have any value in it. Those who do not believe the Word of God has no value. Has no value at all. But when you do believe the Holy Spirit comes into you, all of a sudden, you know what? The Word of God has value. Now, you would think that many in the church, the Word of God still has no value to them because if you start teaching it, they don't stick around. Oh, it's time to study the Word. I'm going for coffee. You know, or I've got to go get something to eat. I had a hard day last night, you know, so I, I'm going to go or I can't I can't get up a Sunday morning and go to church. You know, whatever you'd think that they, they have like a no value in the word of God, because that's what's going to happen when they get there. They're going to have the word of God presented to them. And if it was of great value to them, the, there would be no empty chairs in this room. I don't know what I can do about that. I cannot instill in people a value for the Word of God. I can't do that. It's beyond my control. But I'm not going to stop doing what I do to try to become entertainment, you see. If I do that, I'm a sellout. And too much of the church these days have sold out and they've become entertainers. And they can draw a crowd because they entertain. The Word of God, if you have value in it, will entertain you plenty. I mean, how many times have we cracked up laughing on Wednesday nights over something we just read in Bible study? You know, it can happen in here on Sunday morning as well, but here we're, we're dealing, at this hour anyway, with New Testament, so that's where the rubber meets the road for us. So it's going to have some, you know, this meets us here and now today and what we believe. Or maybe some don't. They don't really believe. They just think going to church makes them a better person, so they show up. You know, how many are like that? Don't raise a hand. You know, because I'm, cause I'm, I'm not saying anyone here is like that. I'm just saying that there are many in the church, they don't really, there's no value in the Word of God for them. It's almost as though they have taken the sting from the stupor and, and, and eh, it's got no value. I, I'm blind to it. I'm deaf to it. I don't hear the Spirit speaking. I don't see it clearly in a spiritual way because I can't. It just doesn't hit me. And these might be professing Christians, but the Word of God doesn't have a place for them. No, if you could twist it a little bit and make it, you know, make it kind of tell me how to live my life today, if you could twist it a whole bunch and tell me I could have my best life now, then, oh, I might show up and pack a cathedral or a, a stadium. You know, if you can get up there with your pom-poms and go rah, 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 and, and, and entertain me a little bit, I, well, we can pack the biggest place in town if we do that. But where's the Word of God in that? You see, they, they, David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and retribution for them. That's sad. The things that should have been their blessings 
Their table is meaning uh, that the, their table here, when he says their table, it's meaning the entire provision of blessings that they would have through, through the Lord and through his word. There's great blessings in that, and they would have that if they would show up for it, but their, their table um, is, is nothing for them. Their backs are bent under the weight of their guilt, right? And, and that's the, what I call the apostate church. The apostate church overlaps with the true church. They might be in the same room, you know. They might be going to the same meetings together at the same church building. You know, you might have a mix of the apostate church and the true church. The apostate church are there because religion is something else to them and they believe that they are meriting it. They believe their, their salvation will come because of things that they do. Because their faith is in what they do and their, and their, their, their earnings, right? It's not in their faith in Christ. Their faith is in their stuff. So that righteousness is a righteousness that's earned, therefore it's worthless in heaven. And they'll be knocking on heaven's door and he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you even though they go down a list of all the things that they did for him, allegedly. That's the apostate church. And let me tell you, it's everywhere. It's all over town. Now, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to name certain church names and say that that's all that's there, because I hope and I trust that in every one of the Christian churches, there are true believers there. I hope so. I hope for that. But what I am saying is in every church there are apostate believers there too that are not real believers. And that church, the apostate church, is growing leaps and bounds in this world. And in the end, in the end time, they will be the majority by far, the biggest group. And the true church that, that, that approaches a righteousness that is given to us by faith in Him alone, we will be the remnant, just like a remnant in Israel had not bowed the knee to Baal. Right? This is the Word of God. To me, how you value God's Word is a direct showing or fruit of showing which side you're on in that. See, those who have a great value in God's Word and place a great value on it and want to learn and want to hear it and, and know that the blessings come from it, you see, they're the, they're the true church, and it, and it means something to them. But those who don't have a lot of value in the Word of God, to me, that's a good sign that they may not be the true church at all. You know, I don't know. I can't make that judgment. He'll make that judgment someday. But the fruit stinks. Because God's Word is what we're supposed to be centered around. It's supposed to be the focal point of the true church. But everywhere where that is the focal point, and that's what you do mostly, more than your entertainment and all of that, the attendance is down in all of the places that do this as, as how they spend their time on Sunday mornings or whatever day they happen to meet. You know, uh, their attendance is down. And the places that are growing and they're busting at the seams and everything are where the peacocks and entertainers hang out. And that's just, that's the way it is. And, and that, to me, is a sign that the apostate church is alive and well and in charge of things there. Could even be the pastors. I don't know. But definitely, if they're preaching a gospel or a salvation that is earned, they're on the wrong side of things there. That is, that is the wrong place to be. It is not earned. I'll, I'll stay in good company with the Apostle Paul. I'll stand next to him. I believe he was telling us the truth. Verses 11 and 12. Again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles how much greater the riches will be their fullness bring? You see, verses 11 through 21 here are dealing with God's righteous sovereign choice. He has a sovereign choice. He gets to make the decisions, right? 
We can't take that away from God. And, and I hear that in so many circles in the church, alleged church too, where they start rubbing genie's bottle and telling him what to do. You ever heard someone command God? Oh, man, that just irritates me. It, it hurts. I mean, it just, ugh, it hurts down in my spirit whenever I hear people doing that. It, it reminds me of someone that got the bottle with a genie in it, and they're rubbing it, and they're saying, come out, genie, and give me what I want. In the name of Jesus. Because if you tack that on it, it's a guarantee, right? If I tell God what I want and say, in the name of Jesus, give me this. Right? What's, what is that? Other than blasphemy. You know? It's taking away God's sovereign choice in everything. He's the one that's sovereign, not us. Right? He's the one that gets to make the real decisions. He's the one that decides, not me. I might beg him for stuff, and I do. I will rub on that bottle, I mean, so to speak, you know, begging. But I'm not commanding any. I, who am I to command God? You know, and it, to me, it's so blasphemous to hear people do that. But they'll teach that in certain Bible schools back in the Midwest, too. You know, if you go there, they'll name their, their, their school after the spoken word, what the Greek word for that means. Because if you speak it, you speak it into existence, and then you can claim it because your words have power. That's what witchcraft says, too. Sounds like witchcraft to me, because in witchcraft, your words have power, and you speak incantations and all these things, and they come true, Right? But yet you're going to put a cross on the top of it and call it part of Christianity. And it's just witchcraft coming into Christianity is all it is. And taking God's sovereignty away from him and commanding him and telling him what to do. Wow, that just hurts. Every time I see that. Anyway, he is the one who is sovereign. And, and, and so when it comes to Israel, Israel did not experience a permanent fall. Okay? They experienced... A time out or uh, go to your room or stand in the corner you know you're having a time out remember we, we use those with our kids right you know you're on a talking time out because they just jabber 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 they won't stop you know or whatever we, we used to give that to our son all the time you're, okay talking time out more of this and less of this you know <laughs> But whatever, you give your kids a timeout, you know, and it's, that's kind of punishment or whatever. Israel's on a timeout. That's really what God was doing with them as a whole, as a nation. But an individual who have said, no, I trust in God. I have faith in Him, and I believe His provision was Christ. Uh, Jesus is the Christ, and I trust in Him. He's my Messiah. Christ, Messiah means same thing, right? Greek, Hebrew, same word. All right, so... Jesus is the Christ. He's Messiah. He, he is that. And, and I believe that. Well, then they're saved. They're in the church. They're, whether they go to synagogue or not, whether they wear the little thing on their head or what, it doesn't matter. If, if their faith is in Christ and they trust God with that, they're saved. You know? And all of us have hang-ups. We have, have things that we might have the lack of understanding in. Uh, so, so you could have a little bit of bad doctrine, right? You could be misguided on some of the things that are non-essentials, like whether or not you, you think the rapture is going to come before the tribulation or in the middle of the tribulation or after. I mean, those are non-essential doctrines. Now, I think that the, the others other than mine are wrong. But I think my position is the one that's right. But they are non-essentials. They, they, those are doctrines that don't have to do with salvation which is essential, or who God is, or who Christ is, who Jesus is. Is there a Holy Spirit? You know, these are doctrines that are non-negotiable. They're essentials, right? And we must have the essentials right to have true unity. But in the non-essentials, we can show liberty, right? Just show charity and everything. But in those things, we must show, have some room for liberty in those. So I'm not talking about the things that whether or not they believe that you uh, should worship on Sunday or Saturday or things like that. These are kind of non-essentials. How are you saved? That's essential. Who's God? That's essential. What is the Word of God? That's essential. Because you'll get all goofed up if you don't believe the Word of God is the Word of God. 
right? If you don't believe that the 66 books are inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by human hand, but it was the Holy Spirit who was the author of the whole Bible, if you don't understand that and believe that and trust in that, then you'll have all kinds of other troubles because you'll pick and choose the parts of it that you think are right. And so when it comes to your method of salvation, where Paul is clear that it's by faith alone and by grace extended to us, not by merit, eh, we push that aside because we like our merit-based stuff, right? We, we want to start introducing some more things. Now you're messing with, now you're messing with an essential doctrine that has to be agreed upon or you're not part of the true church of Christ. So anyway, Israel as a nation rejects the basic doctrines of Christ and, and God's method of salvation. They rejected that and they wanted it to still be through the law. So as a religion, they're on a timeout. They're not in God's plan. They will repent. There will be a time where they'll change their mind and they'll change their tune on that and they will accept Him. But it won't be until He comes back and proves it. And some brave rabbi runs up to Him and says, Sir, or Lord, if He's English, you know, you know <laughs> and says, Is this your first trip or your second? Because he's honest and he wants to know. And when the Lord says, this is my second trip, Hoss, then he's going to fall to his knees and say, my Lord and my God. Just like Thomas did, right? But until then, many will wait until that day, but they will when he shows up and they'll, they'll fall to their knees and accept him. And that's when Israel and Jewish religion will become Christianity. It will return to worshiping the right God. You know, because they've got this God that doesn't have a son that became flesh. You know, it's a different version of God. And actually, too much of the time, they make Moses a God. You know, that, that's kind of sad. But I'm sure Moses is rolling over in his grave over that. But anyway, uh, Israel is down but not gone. And remember what I said earlier about every heresy has been dealt with in advance? This whole chapter here is dealing with this replacement theology that's a heresy in the church. It's, it's just wrong doctrine. Not that someone could be taught that and believe it's true and be saved, because that's possible, because much of that is non-essential doctrine, but the part that has to do with salvation, that's essential. And so if it, if it made them think that they were earning their salvation somehow in it, then they missed the boat, you know. But anyway, uh, they're gone, but they're down, but not gone. Their stumbling has brought about salvation to the Gentiles because when they said, no, we want to keep our law, we want to keep our temple and all that kind of thing, God says, well, then I'm ripping this curtain from top to bottom, which had to be miraculous. Try to do that to a curtain sometime. Grab it up by where it goes over the rod and rip it from there. No, if you're going to rip it, you're going to start at the bottom and rip up, right? But God ripped that curtain from the top down. That's a miracle right there. And it was a sign. He's saying, I'm out of here. Because previous to that, he manifested his presence in the Holy of Holies. You know, between the cherubim. On the Ark of the Covenant, if it was there then. I don't know. But uh, whatever it was, it was the symbolic thing that when Jesus died on the cross, they rejected him. He tore the curtain in the temple from top to bottom and said, I'm out of here. And Jesus had predicted it when he talked to the woman at the well and said, the time is coming where true worshipers will not worship God at the mountain or at the temple, but in spirit and in truth. The time is coming and has now arrived because he was standing there, you know. Uh, and so that came true. God left the temple and he's out of Judaism and he's in the hearts of the believers. And that's where he is now, you see. And that's New Testament theology. That's what we're taught in the Gospels and in all of these, these things that, uh, these other letters that we get from Peter and Paul and James and John and the other writers, Jude, you know, anyway, um, verses 13 through 16. I'm talking to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I make much of my ministry. 
in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. See, the root of Christianity were Jews. The branch, you know what I'm saying? So, so there is a set apartness, by the way, the word holy means set apart. So those who are Jewish are set apart for salvation. You know, it's offered to them. They just have to receive him and, and put their faith in him in order to accept it. But it's offered to them. It's offered to the whole world who has heard the gospel. But if you're Jewish, you've heard the gospel. Even if you don't have the Gospels as far as the first four books of the New Testament, if you don't have, you may not have those, but the Gospel is in the Old Testament as well. It was predicted, it was, it was prophesied that it was going to happen that way. If they were paying attention, they would have got it. So if you're Jewish, you know enough about God to know Jesus is Messiah. The, Christ, the, the, the Messiah was sent to them, and they rejected him. So it's just a matter of, do you want to trust in your religion and your people, the synagogues and all that, or do you want to trust in God and his provision? That's the choice that they have to make. Anyway, he says, if the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, yeah, that's, that's an interesting wording you use. Um, anyway, uh, here, he hopes that his ministry to the Gentiles will draw at least some of his fellow countrymen out into the light. And he's hoping, maybe through jealousy, maybe they'll, they'll notice God's blessing is on these people, and they'll want some of that too. And so they'll start to listen, you know, whatever it takes. Uh, maybe as they see God's blessing working greatly in the Gentiles, they'll become spiritually envious, is what he's trying to say. So again, if, if we are blessed richly by Israel's loss, just, how, just imagine how much their restoration would bless us all. And that, that's kind of an argument he's making here. Well, we're blessed by their loss. What if they were restored? How much more might we be blessed through that? That could really be cool, right? That's... That's the argument he's making. The grammar in verse 15, the second half anyway, tells us that their restoration is not if, but when. If you look at that, for their rejection is the reconciliation of the world. What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? In the grammar built into his verse, he's, saying, it's, he's not saying if they were, it's when they do. As if it's going to happen. So you see, that, that's interesting there. It's not a maybe, but a fact. They will be reconciled. Verse 16 then says, If the first fruit is holy, then the whole batch is holy. So if the, if the root is holy, so are the branches. These are two different illustrations that tell us the concept of whatever is first contributes its character to what follows. Is, is that concept we get from that. And he's using that in... in um, Israel versus the church. So the character of them was contributed to what followed, which is the church. Um, it's the, actually, let's see, the, the first... The first fruits, the first is from God's instruction to the Israelites to take some of the dough from their first harvest of wheat each harvest season, uh, beginning with the first year after entering the promised land was when they started doing that. Make a cake of it, offer it to God, and this is the first fruits offering that made holy or brought God's blessing to the rest of the harvest. By bringing him first fruits, then his blessings would be extended to the rest is um, where that went there. But um, the analogy here with the first fruit is pointing to God's covenant with Abraham. Uh, so, all right, let's go on to verse 17 get the rest of the second illustration. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over those branches. 
If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. In other words, um, branches broke off represents the nation Israel. Okay? And, and they're of the root. And the root supports us, the church. In other words, anti-Semitism is kind of being dealt with here too. Don't start hating on the Jews. Just because they rejected theologically and everything, don't start hating on them. They're still to be prayed for and loved. Um, the, the wild shoots grafted in represent the Gentile Christians, those of us who were not Jewish at all. Um, so uh, grafted into the root, which is the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, Romans 4 said Abraham is the father of all who would believe. Right? Abraham, the, the Jews like to claim Abraham as Father Abraham, right? Because their ancestry comes through him. But Romans chapter 4 says that he's the father of all who would believe, whether they are of his descendants or not. Because he's the father spiritually of those who would believe and their faith would be credited as righteousness. See, Abraham was saved. His faith was credited to him as righteousness, according to Hebrews 11, right? His faith was credited to him as righteousness. He, Abraham didn't have the law, right? He didn't have the law of Moses. That came 450 years later. He, he had faith in God. And his descendants then became Israel and came up with the law through Moses and all that. But Abraham was saved. How that happened? He didn't even have the law. Well, Hebrews tells us he was saved because of his faith in God's provision. God loved that and credited him with righteousness because of the faith. So there again, it was God's righteousness imputed onto Abraham because he believed. Not because he was a great person. He kind of was, but you know, he wasn't perfect. He still did some wrong things. And he had lapses in his faith. He had time that shows us in, in Genesis how well he had little lapses in his faith and didn't quite believe all the way. But he did trust God. And when God spoke to him and said things, he acted on it and did it. And he, he exemplified that by being willing to sacrifice Isaac. And God stopped him and said, no, I don't want you to kill your son. I just want to know you would because I told you to. You'd trust me. You'd trust that somehow I'd make it right. There's no room for anti-Semitism in the church of Jesus Christ. Every heresy that ever crept into the church was dealt with in advance and anticipated previous to it even happening. Anti-Semitism, the, the hatred towards Israel that has gone into some of the church and they, you know, what did Hitler call, you know, the Jews, the, the Germans and the Nazis then called the Jews Christ killers? Right? There was a hatred for them and all of that. That's very, that's, anti-Semitism is very unbiblical. Right here is Paul, Paul is saying there's no room for that. And we're not supposed to think in those ways. There's no room for it. We actually owe our salvation to them by bringing it to us, bringing it out. Those who did believe and left it brought us salvation. So, you will say then, verse 19, branches were broke off so that I could be grafted in. Granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. The reason that... And, and this is getting into sparing um, in a physical sense. Okay, if I'm a believer, I'm his. I'm not destined for hell. I, I'm his, I'm bought at a price, I'm his. But if I start acting up, he might take me out of this world. <laughs> right? He may cut me off because I'm being unproductive. I'm not producing for him. So that's a branch that's cut off. Right? So that's, he's, Paul's going to start talking that way. So where does that leave the church? That... The, the, the part of the church that leaves him and doesn't put their faith in him and says, no, we're going to go back to the legalism of keeping the lists of rules of do's and don'ts because we think we can merit our salvation. Remember the apostate church? They're cut off. There's, there's no salvation in that. 
It's in faith alone, see? So the, the church wouldn't, if the whole church became apostate, then the church is no good anymore and be cut off and is no longer God's method. But the remnant will be taken out, taken up to be with him. Now I'm hoping that's millions of people. You know, uh, I'm, I'm sure that between those who are caught up to meet the Lord in the air because they're still alive at the time and those who are the dead in Christ that are resurrected, there's millions and millions total there uh, because there have been generations and generations of true believers. But I'm hoping that the, the, when that rapture, the harpazo that happens, uh, the catching up of the true believers of Christ when that happens, I'm hoping it's millions of people. I really hope it is. Because there are millions of people claiming to be Christian. But there will be millions of people still in churches that next Sunday after the rapture. Maybe then they'll say, oops, what was that that I was taught in God's Word, that thing that we don't use that much anymore? Let's get it down and dust it off and start reading it and seeing what it says. Oh, oops, I was supposed to trust in His righteousness, not my own. Wow, well, I missed the rapture, but maybe He'll forgive me for that, and maybe I can be His now. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff they have to live through. But... Um, Anyway, history shows how the church, the Christian church in Europe and England, once thriving, had grown faithless. And now you can visit thousands of great monuments to Christianity that are like empty houses now. All over Europe. There's a, there's a regrowth in Europe these days I'm hearing about, though, where people are coming back around. Anyway, I'm going to close there today. We'll pick up verse 22 next time and finish out chapter 11 next week. Um, but, you know, I, I just can't say enough. We, we have to stick to God's Word because the minute we stop studying through it and learning the things from it, the, that's the minute we become irrelevant in the world. And even if the pews are mostly empty... That's just, that's, that's up to him. I can't instill in people a hunger for the word or a desire or, an, or a, a value for the word of God. I think those who do value the word of God show up and they are taught the word of God here and they appreciate that. I think those of you who are here are testifying to that fact. You appreciate the word of God and being taught from that. Um, but... You know, that's those, those who don't and want something else and want to be entertained, stay home and watch football. You know, what else? Go fishing. Whatever there are. There's plenty of other things to do on Sunday. Our whole culture nowadays is trying to, you know, plan things on Sundays so people don't go to church. Happens all the time. Anyway. Let's close that downer note with a word of prayer. And I don't mean to be downer, but let's hope that things are going to improve and, and, and stand up around here. So, all right. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and blessing us through it, that this table we have been given is a table of blessing and provision. And thank you for it. Thank you that we stick to this around here, Lord. And I pray that more and more places they would start to champion your word and learn from it again and that there would be fewer in the apostate church and more come into the true church of understanding you and that their salvation has to be borrowed. The righteousness is not of their own deeds. It has to be granted to them from you. And Lord, while we're at it, thank you so much for that because we couldn't earn it ourselves. Thank you so much. And as, as you bless us throughout the rest of this week, we stand grateful. And we look forward to seeing what you'll bring us next time. And all these things we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Lord be with you all.